I really miss uh, the country, the people, the food. Uh, it's been wonderful. So I'm back. Uh, I got four days only. I had to steal it from uh, my trip that I just came back from Ni uh, Nigeria and getting back to Washington. But I knew it was important. It was time for me uh, to come home. Uh, so I have a really packed schedule and a lot of events. And we're going to try to fit them all in. But this was, for me, the most important event. Uh, that I'm participating in, and that's the opportunity to talk to young people. Uh, you old people in the room, and some of you are my friends. <laughs> uh, I apologize, because this is for the young people. And I know that you understand how important it is for us to uh, address uh, the, the youth. But I'd like to offer some of my thoughts on where Liberia has come, the challenges that Liberia as a country still faces, and how all of us can do our part. And notice I said us. I didn't say you. Because we are part of it. How all of us can do our part to secure a bright future for Liberia and for its people. First of all, let me congratulate all Liberians on the tremendous progress your country has made in recent years. To quote your president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Liberia's people have moved from tragedy to triumph. The 15-year civil war that ended in 2003 devastated the country in every aspect imaginable. GDP fell by 90%. What that meant is you had a 10% GDP. People can't feed themselves on a 10% GDP. But 13 years later, Liberia has become a champion of democracy and peace. It has taken some important first steps in the difficult tasks of rebuilding its economy and strengthening its educational and healthcare delivery system, even in the face of the unprecedented challenges like Ebola epidemic that you faced just last year and you are still dealing with. You have shown a commitment to fostering an open society by joining the Open Government Partnership and the Partnership on Illicit Finance, and it has put you put in place laws and mechanisms to improve transparency, accountability, and to fight corruption. A lot more needs to be done. It's also notable that during the past 13 years of peace, Liberia has held three free and fair nationwide elections. Now, some people might quiver with me on that statement, but they were elections that led to decisions that were accepted by the politicians and by the people. You've had two presidential elections. You've had one Senate midterm election. Liberians showed tremendous resilience and faith in the, in the midst of and the aftermath of the Ebola crisis. And as I mentioned, I came one day during that crisis and I was also devastated. Uh, by what I saw happening, uh, the frustration and the despair on the faces of Liberians. But we got through it. The task ahead is to make sure Liberia stays on this positive trajectory. Liberia has moved up the democracy ladder and is moving toward a more prosperous future. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So despite this impressive progress, Liberia continues to face daunting challenges and real risk of backsliding remains. And we can't let that happen. You can't let that happen. The Ebola epidemic exposed the fragility of Liberia's health sector and your economy. Over 50% of Liberia's population is under 18. This presents great opportunities, but it also has significant challenges as well. To accommodate this population bulge, Liberia must create jobs. It must develop infrastructure. It has to diversify its economy and improve its education system. More importantly, it must remain stable. All of these things are going to be challenges for Liberians moving forward, given the depressed economic conditions and in particular the global slump in commodity prices, which impacts Liberia's principal exports and contributes to low economic growth. 
While the government can do very little to affect commodity prices, much more can be done to improve, improve the country's investment climate. According to the World Bank, 2016 ease of doing business indicators, Liberia was ranked 179 out of 189, meaning you're at the bottom. As you yourselves undoubtedly feel this is not good enough, and as a result, Liberia is being left behind. It's being left behind some of its more dynamic regional neighbors, such as Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, Cote d'Ivoire was in the throes of a civil war, practically, uh, when, uh, when I left here in, uh, in 2012. And now they're outpacing Liberia on the economic front. One of the major challenges to the private sector, we're being told by American companies, uh, in Liberia in particular, but Africa writ large, is corruption. We gotta fight corruption. If we want to see this country progress, as President Obama said last year in Ethiopia, nothing will unlock Africa's economic potential more than ending the cancer of corruption. Corruption robs countries of vital resources needed to move forward on development. Liberia can't afford to lose resources. So all of us must commit to working together to stop corruption at all levels and stop people from using their political connections to build their bank accounts and build their mansions. <laughs> stay focused on maintaining peace and enforcing the rule of law and providing security. Now more than ever as Liberia prepares for the challenges of taking on sole responsibility and taking on the reins for the security of its people. I'm confident that Liberia is ready for this challenge, but it's going to require resolve. It's going to require ingenuity. It's going to require agility in the face of challenges, the same attributes that brought Liberia so far from its darkest days. Added to the challenges facing Liberia, Africa as well as Afri West Africa face these challenges are persistent threats of terrorism. You should be grateful that you have not yet, yet felt the terror that your neighbors have experienced. I just came from Nigeria, where I was at a conference hosted by the Nigerians on Boko Haram, where we discussed with Nigeria and with Nigeria's neighbors and their partners how we can tackle Boko Haram, which is having a devastating impact on the people of the Lake Chad Basin region and on those countries. You know that Mali, Burkina Faso, and your neighbor Cote d'Ivoire were recently targeted, and their citizens, Africans from across the continent, and tourists uh, were devastated by that. And these acts of terror threaten to undermine many of the gains the region has made over the past decade. People, let me tell you, Liberia is not exempt from the threat. Capacity building and commitment by Liberia's security services must be a priority for this country. These are just some of the current challenges, and they are challenges, that Liberia's current and next administration must be prepared to address. But in the face of numerous obstacles, Liberians have remained incredibly resilient. And notice I use that word a lot, because you are a resilient people. And that's why I know that ultimately, Liberia will succeed. So let me talk a little bit about U.S.-Liberia's relationship. As Liberia moves forward, the United States will continue to be a dedicated partner. 
The U.S.-Liberia relationship dates back nearly 200 years. Since 2004, the United States has con contributed over $1 billion in foreign assistance to this country. One billion. We are fully invested in Liberia's promise, and like you, we want to see that promise realized. Liberia has one of the lowest, one of the lowest electricity rates in the world. In Monrovia, only 6.7% of the population has access to electricity, and thank God it's in here. I got the air conditioning. Uh, by 2030, Liberia aims to connect 70% of Monrovia to the electricity grid and provide access to 35% of the rest of the country. The United States through Power Africa is committed to continuing to support Liberia's efforts to meet these goals. The Power Africa initiative is making a major impact by supporting energy sector development through the expansion of the grid in Monrovia and the construction of small-scale renewable pilot projects. We're also making progress in implementing the $257 million Liberian Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact. And I'm very proud that Liberia qualified for an MCC Compact. And it was not easy. The MCC Compact aims to improve road infrastructure as well as support the expansion of access to reliable and affordable electricity. To achieve these goals, the Compact includes funding for the rehabilitation of Mount Coffee hydroelectric plant. And when that plant is at full capacity, Liberia will be in a position to provide electricity to all of its people, but Europe will be in a position to even provide electricity beyond that. So this is a big deal. Part of the project will also uh, include the development of a training center for technicians in the electricity sector. It will support, provide support for the creation of an independent energy sector regulator and support for the development of a nationwide road maintenance framework. So this is going to have a major impact on your infrastructure. And when that infrastructure starts to improve, you will see businesses flourish in this country. We continue to help Liberia recover from the devastating Ebola outbreak. Ebola killed thousands of our families and friends. It drained vitally needed resources. It slowed economic growth and it delayed key development projects. The United States led a worldwide response that helped Liberia bring Ebola under control and our commitment endures. We're working with Liberia to build resilient health systems. We're continuing research on Ebola and other emerging diseases and beginning programming through our global health security agenda to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. Through our commitment to Liberia's peace and security, we have supported the development of the armed forces of Liberia uh, a, an extraordinary group of young men who are working for Liberia's future. As we enter into a new phase of collaboration with the AFL, I want to congratulate the officers and soldiers who truly develop into a professional force for good. These dedicated men and women, and women, have proven capable of safeguarding Liberia's sovereignty. President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. Are there any Yali in the room? They're probably off working somewhere. Uh, this has been a tremendous success. Through Yali, we have brought 31 Liberians to the United States over the past two years for six weeks of academic and leadership training. This year, we're doubling the size of the program Africa-wide. It was 500 a year for the past two, two years, and now it will be 1,000 a year. And we'll have 25 Yali fellows from Liberia. And that's really big, given the population of Liberia. What is so extraordinary about Yali, in fact, it's, it's extraordinary, period, is that 
These young people are the future. They are the future of your country, and they are the future of your continent. They are able to connect with their cohorts all over the continent of Africa. Uh, they have become a network that moves across the electronic uh, communication and they exchange ideas that they can share with each other. I know that back in 2014, when the Yali Fellows were in Washington and the Liberian ones, we had three who were in the healthcare sector. When I traveled to South Africa later in 2014, I found out that Yalis in South Africa were raising money to help your Yalis here in, in, in Liberia. They would never have known each other had they not engaged with each other in this program. So again, we're talking about an outstanding program. I meet with them wherever I go. I'm gonna meet the Yali fellows here tonight. And I'm really excited uh, that we will have the 2016 fellows uh, in, in the room. They're already making major contributions to Liberia. Recently, Yali alumni from Liberia founded their own NGO called the Mandela Washington Fellowship Liberia which is the name of the program in Washington. They are implementing a program called iMentor. It engages and mentors young community leaders in four counties through a Train the Trainers program on leadership and community activism. And just this past weekend, the group conducted an iMentor program in Ruhrville for 400 local youth. And this is going to be an important initiative as we start moving forward and preparing for the next phase of politics here in Liberia. That young people who are smart, who are leaders, can work with young people who are less fortunate to make sure that they understand what their responsibilities are as citizens of this country. These are just some of the examples of the benefits that the Strong U.S.-Liberia Partnership is providing to Liberia, and they demonstrate the rapid progress that Liberia is making. But ultimately, Liberia needs to be in the driver's seat. You have to be in the driver's seat for your own future and for your ongoing development. And the same goes for democracy. Only Liberians can determine the course of Liberia's democracy and the kind of democracy that you want. And a strong, inclusive democracy is absolutely essential to secure the progress that Liberia has made. So this brings me to the upcoming elections. For the United States, democracy and governance are a key priority, not just here in Liberia, all over the continent. If you hear me speak anywhere, I was on the Hill last week, and I talked about the importance of democracy and governance. There are more than a dozen elections in Africa this year, and probably more than a dozen in Africa in 2017, including Liberia. Liberia's 2017 elections are an opportunity for Liberians to create your own destiny and to show the world that Liberia is a strong democracy and to show the world your great respect for the Constitution and for the people of Liberia. President Sirleaf is stepping down after two terms in office. This is a big deal because there are a lot of countries where there are term limits and presidents don't step down. And we know that people want transitions. Afrobarometer did a a survey across Africa, and 75% of the people surveyed said they wanted transitions. But leaders don't listen to them. So we have a lot of countries where presidents have changed the Constitution to stay in power longer, where there are no term limits and they've been in power for life, uh, where there are no uh, plans for transition. So you have the opportunity. You have the opportunity to actually have an election where you will experience a transfer of power in accordance with the law. And I have to tell you, I applaud the president and I applaud you for that critical decision. That decision gives you, the people, the youth of Liberia, 
an historic opportunity. For the young people in the room, this will really be your first, be the first, you will be the first generation to see the peaceful transition of power from one living city president to another, both elected by the people. When this happens, Liberia will be an example of a true democracy in Africa and a leader for other countries in the continent to emulate. People will be watching. The elections are well over a year away, and it's far too early to turn away from the business of governing. It is not, however, too soon for you to think about what shape you want your country's future to take. The upcoming elections, rather than being a challenge, ought to be viewed as an opportunity. An opportunity for you to demand that presidential candidates put forward a vision of unity, a vision of peace, their vision of democracy, and you can then elect a leader who will carry Liberia forward toward the future. For many of you young people here today, this will be your first opportunity to vote for a president. And you need to get out and vote. You need to look carefully at the candidates, look at their platforms, look at their records, and ask them what their vision is for your future. Ask thoughtful questions and demand responses. This young men and women, and I stress women, is your opportunity to help shape the future of this country. Liberians need to get away from personality politics and stress issues. Politicians need to stand on platforms. You need to stand on platforms and not personalities. It's not about who you are, it's what you are that ought to make a difference in your politics. And the voters need to know what you are. They need to know what you stand for. They need to know what you believe in. They need to know how you are going to contribute to their futures. Once the political season begins to heat up, and you're seeing that in the United States, so I'm not gonna comment on US politics. I could probably give the same speech there. <clears throat> Politicians must be conscious in their actions and their words that they don't contribute to violence. I say to you, don't allow yourself, this is to you young people, to be used as political pawns. Politicians must actively work to promote national unity and demand a peaceful process even while competing to earn your votes. They need to think about others and not just about themselves. And they must think carefully about their policies. And if you ask the right questions, they will think about policies. How would you have dealt with the Ebola situation? They need to answer that question for you. What are your plans for building the economy? How are you gonna create jobs for all of us young people who are going to be graduating from college this year? How are you going to engage with the international community? What are your bilateral consultations with foreign governments going to be like? What are you going to be promoting for Liberia? Ask tough questions. And actually, they're easy questions. Ask questions, period, of politicians. And then, finally, on election day, get out to vote, because democracy doesn't start on election day. Democracy is a process, and it goes, it's ongoing, and it goes on. But on election day, you need, if you really believe in what you're doing, you need to get out and vote. You will reaffirm your commitment to peaceful change through democratic processes, rather than riots and taking to the streets, Candidates, likewise, will need to accept the will of the people as expressed through the ballot box. And if your candidate doesn't win, do not immediately assume fraud or rigged election. 
Liberia has had some good procedures in place to handle electoral disputes, and they have a good electoral process in place. We have worked with them over many years, and they have built capacity over those years. And I tell you, people, look at Nigeria. Nobody would have expected Nigeria to have free, fair, transparent elections and vote out the ruling party and vote in the opposition and have the election results accepted by the party that was voted out. That's democracy. Recognizing that significant challenges remain with respect to the organization of elections, we're still confident that the National Election Commission will and can run free, fair, and transparent elections, just as they've done in the past. And we're also certain that the Liberian security agencies will be able to secure polling stations and ballots and work alongside the net to ensure these elections are a success. And I can tell you, we will be here as well. There will be election observers throughout this country as we have been in the past, as we were in Nigeria. And we will call it like we see it. We don't have a candidate. We don't support politicians. We support politics, we support democracy, and we support the people. So whoever the people, whoever the people of, Nigeria, of Liberia decide to vote and support and elect, that's your choice. We want the process to be free and fair. And let me stress, it must be, uh, violence must be avoided. It must be avoided at all costs. No single person in this country or anywhere in the world should die in the effort to express their political beliefs. And all politicians should be clear about that. You need to tell your people, do not commit violent acts in your name. Watch what you say to your people so that they don't misunderstand what you are saying. They need to know that you will not support them if they resort to, to violence. And finally, and as important as the 2017 elections will be, it bears repeating that they are still more than a year away and Liberians can't afford to focus solely on elections. Elections are just one milestone in a democracy. And as I noted earlier, democracy is a constant process requiring continued, consistent efforts to move forward. So in conclusion, when I think about Liberia's future, I think first of all of all the hardworking, resilient, intelligent, and kind Liberians that I've gotten to know over my many, many years of working in this country. Because of you, the Liberian people, I have tremendous confidence in Liberia's future. I know that Liberia will continue to grow into its role as a leader in Africa. And to the students here today, and I'm really pleased to see so many of you, uh, to all Liberians, I urge you to listen to the words of your president who said at a Harvard University graduation ceremony, and this is not a political statement, and I quote it all the time, I quote it in the United States because I go into underserved communities in the US and I speak to young people about how important it is for them to have a vision for their future and how important it is for them to want to be somebody. But what President Sirleaf said that resonated with me when she gave that speech at Harvard she said, and I quote, if your dreams do not scare you, they're not big enough. You need to pursue scary dreams. You need to dream big, you need to believe in yourself, and you need to believe in your country. Every single one of you, your country, you need to believe in your country. We know that as Liberians, you can take charge of your faith. We saw this in your response to Ebola, and I want you to know that the United States stands with the people and the government of Liberia as you chart your path, as you chart your path toward a peaceful and prosperous future. And you become an example 
of democracy and prosperity for the rest of Africa to follow. Thank you very much.